The following is a production of New Mexico State University. Incorporated, which I think is out of Dallas, but it doesn't say here. But anybody out of Dallas, if you're a Cowboy fan, that's got to be good. Um, James leads the Public Strategies Government Relations Practice Group, but he has a, an extensive background in Washington, D.C. He served in the Bush administration as Chief of Staff for the Consumer Product Safety Commission and as Chief of Staff of the Transportation Security Administration of the Department of Homeland Security, which is, of course, all of our favorite organization now when we go to the airport. And uh, James has had also an extensive background with Senator Domenici, having worked for him for several years on a number of issues. Would you please welcome James Fuller, Manager Director of Public Strategies Incorporated. Thank you. Anyone who has spent any time in New Mexico knows that small business is literally the engine that drives this state. And coming from a family of a small business owner, I can tell you that the biggest headache, the worst worry, and the nightmare that lies ahead for my dad was always health care. It always meant for him a decision between paying employees, maintaining his business, or having the luxury, the luxury of health care insurance. Today, we have the honor, and I have the honor, to introduce to this conference a senator, a leader, an educator, Hank Brown. Hank has served at almost every level of government. He has taken many, many years of his life to educate our children. He lives in Colorado, where they spell chili with an I, not an E. We'll get that corrected. But he serves now, currently, as a professor of political science and as the president emeritus of the University of, Ch of Colorado. He has also served as a president and a CEO, running a foundation that was committed, spent billions of dollars committed to improving communities and, com and improving people's lives. He served as a United States Senator, but as our Senator did, he started in the front lines. He started in the front lines serving as a state Senator first, helping his community grow and helping problems like health care become opportunities for folks. He moved from the state legislature to serve in the United States House of Representatives where he served for five consecutive terms. And then he made the decision like Senator Domenici that there was another calling and it was the United States Senate where he served with honor. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to end with the last piece in his rhetoric. He served in the United States Navy and he volunteered to go to Vietnam. I hope you will join me. And I hope everyone here will gear up for what I think will be one of the hottest topics at this wonderful conference, and that is how do we fix health care reform, not for the major corporations, not whether it's a singer payer or a dual payer, but how do we fix health care reform where it doesn't lead to be the most number one reason for personal bankruptcy in this nation? How do we fix health care where it's no longer 20% of our GDP because that is not a sustaining model? And how do we fix health care where people like my father doesn't have to worry about how to insure his employees and his family? Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Hank Brown to the Domenici Policy Conference. And as and as I can see, as he walks up, he is a recent uh, graduate of our United States health care system. Thank you, Senator, for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you. What a treat to be here. Uh, it is true, I, uh, I had a disagreement with my dog. We have a little St. Bernard, and uh, we disagreed over which way she was going to go, and uh, she won, as uh, maybe you can tell. What a treat for me to come to New Mexico. Uh, you know, when I was first elected to the House of Representatives, the first uh, committee that I served on was Interior. And our leader there was uh, Manny Lujan, 
What a wonderful, wonderful human being. He was a great leader of that committee and a great mentor of mine. Uh, his service in the House of Representatives and later as Secretary of Interior made an enormous difference for the West. And so it's a, it's a delight to get a chance to see him again and uh, recall old memories. When I first went to the U.S. Senate, uh, uh, the major committee that I joined, uh, first of all, was the Budget Committee. Not the easiest one to serve on, one with real challenges. And the chairman of that committee was Pete Domenici, one of the most brilliant legislators in the history of our nation. It was such a treat to uh, watch him in action, to learn from him, uh, to observe his integrity, his commitment, and his pure genius in working with other people. So, Pete, it's an honor for me to come today, and I, I really feel privileged to be part of it. New Mexico has always had a, a, a great commitment to technology and science, uh, and a particular interest in the space program of a wide range, and I couldn't help but think of Neil Armstrong as I flew down uh, with it. I suspect most of you will remember, or at least the students will have heard about Neil Armstrong's comment when he was the first human being to walk on the moon. Uh, he said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I think most of you will recall that. I suspect very few of you recall what he said when he reboarded the spacecraft. Uh, to remind you, he mentioned uh, his words were these, uh, good luck, Mr. Grosky. Nobody could figure out what he meant. Who was Grosky? Uh, the NASA officials were asked about it. This is a true story. They asked about it. They, they didn't know who it was. They checked out. Maybe it's a Russian cosmonaut he'd gotten to know. No, it wasn't that. Uh, when they asked him about it, when he had his press conference, he declined to comment. And it wasn't until 26 years later uh, at a press conference in, in Florida, You've, you saw the, the results of the press conference. Um, they asked him about uh, this Mr. Gronsky, uh, Grosky comment. And he said, well, the Groskys have passed away. I guess I, can, I can't tell you what I, I meant by it. He said, when I grew up in Ohio in, uh, in 1938, we were playing baseball out in front of the house. And, and someone hit a ball over towards the Grosky house, and I went over to pick it up, and I was just under their window picking it up, and I heard Mrs. Grosky in a, love, a loud voice say, Sex? You want sex? You'll get sex when the boy next door walks on the moon. <laughs> um, it, it is a true story, at least the Neil Armstrong part. I, I don't know about the other. Well, look, we have a raging debate over health care. I think in mo the typical American fashion, that debate is a good debate because it helps us learn more about the subject, to take a fresh look at it, and I'm convinced out of this will come uh, some movement forward uh, as we look at it. One of the things that's been said in that debate is that American health care costs lots more than anybody else in, in the world, and the results we get are worse. And when they say results, they talk about uh, uh, not just paying more, but ending up having a higher infant mortality rate than uh, many of the countries, not all, but many of the countries in, uh, in Europe, and uh, a lower life expectancy than some of the countries in Europe and Japan. And those figures are both accurate. We do spend more, roughly 50% more than many of the, uh, the, the northern European countries uh, on a per capita basis or as a percent of GDP. Um, and we do have a lower infant mortality rate or a higher infant mortality rate uh, than many of the countries, not all, uh, in that area. Obviously, uh, you, you compare it to developed countries because the developed countries do much better than the underdeveloped countries. Uh, and we do have a, a, a lower life expectancy than some of the countries uh, in Europe, uh, not all. Uh, we're ahead, depending on how you calculate it, of, of Germany and, and the United Kingdom if you look at life expectancy at a particular age. What are the facts behind that? Because obviously that drives part of the health care debate and the discussion. Well, first of all, our health care is more costly. We do spend more on it. Here's some of the reasons I think why. One, we have more doctors. Two, we pay them more, and I say more on a per capita basis. We have more physicians, we have more nurses, we have more health care providers. Two, we pay them more. The amount we pay them more than perhaps their counterparts in Europe and Japan is roughly equivalent to the amount that we pay everybody in America more 
our standard of living and our rate of compensation is more than those in Europe, uh, is more than those in Japan. So it's in line with that differentiation, but indeed it's more. But there's some other factors that lead to uh, the higher cost. There's a difference in facilities where ours tend to be much more modern, more up to date. There's a significant difference in the equipment we have in terms of healthcare uh, in the United States. Let me give you an example. About a decade ago, a, uh, uh, an equipment manufacturer, medical equipment uh, producer uh, called Alaris came up with a wonderful new development. It's really just simply an application of technology uh, for us. It was, uh, Alaris came up with an infusion pump that used software to monitor the infusion of drugs uh, that are administered in hospitals. And the facts they were working off was a recognition that hospitals around the world, uh, about one out of every 1,000 times you administer drugs, uh, the person who inputs that drug into the machine, and I say inputs, programs it in, gets it wrong. And about one out of 1,000 times there's a potential lethal, lethal uh, uh, dose of medicine uh, that's given to a patient in a hospital. Uh, now, one out of a thousand uh, seems like a low, uh, low portion, but think about a hospital with 350 uh, beds. Uh, that's one death every three days. Obviously, if it's, uh, if it's you, that seems to make a difference. Their technology input software into the machine. So they, did one of the, they do a, a scan of the wristband that all patients in the hospital have. It inputs into the, the, the computer, into the software, uh, the, the particulars on the patient, it compares it to a standard base that the hospital comes up with regard to providing medicine. And if the, if the medicine is out of standard, more than what it should be or less than what it should be, uh, and that can happen. Uh, uh, a nurse or other provider can input into the computer uh, 0.005 instead of 0.05 or put in 0.05 instead of 0.005. Those kind of mistakes do happen from time to time. If they get it wrong, this software uh, on the machine automatically cuts off the administration of medicine and literally saves thousands of lives um, every year. That machine cost a little more than the other infusion pumps that were available on the market. Obviously an enormous step forward, endorsed by uh, most of the scientific journals. It was one quick acceptance in the United States. It was uh, on the list by the major hospitals to be purchased. They were unable to sell it in Europe. They were unable to sell it in much of the rest of the world except for Japan uh, would buy a few. Some of the uh, more expensive healthcare providers in the Middle East uh, bought it, but literally the sales of that went to the United States. A few in Canada, but not very many. Why? The policy in Europe is to hold control cost. Now, one of the ways they control cost is to limit the equipment that they purchase. They do buy equipment that 10 years from now they'll pick that up because it'll be a, a broad state-of-the-art item. Presumably the price might be a little lower, uh, but they tend to wear out their equipment rather than buy the new equipment. So we have better equipment, we have more doctors, we have more nurses, we have more health care providers. And one of the biggest differences in cost is accessibility. Uh, unlike Europe, Canada, uh, even some other nations in the world, it's very easy to get to see a health care provider here generally, uh, not for all categories, but generally. And the big difference is in specialties. Uh, the specialties end up being much more accessible. Whereas in, uh, in the United Kingdom or other areas, you might wait six months to see a specialist uh, for a very specific disease that needs attention. Here, you can generally see them very quickly. So yes, our health care does cost more on a per capita basis, uh, somewhat significantly more. We seem to get more in some ways. On the other side of worth results, people point to the infant mortality rate, and they point to uh, the longevity, and indeed our longevity is, uh, is not quite what it is in some other of the European countries. In a way that compares apples to oranges, let me, let me suggest to you what I mean by that. About three-fourths to four-fifths of uh, the factors that determine your longevity um, are non-medical treatment factors. In other words, only 20% to 25% really relate, relate to the medical treatment uh, you get. Picking your ancestors uh, is, uh, is a very helpful f factor if you can do that. It seems to make a difference. 
Obesity makes a big difference. Let me share you with a number because I think it's interesting. Uh, uh, the, uh, the national numbers show 36% of Americans uh, are obese. I'm sorry, 32% of Americans are obese. Compared to that, Japan, that's 3% obese. France, that's 9.5%. Germany, that's 136 Americans are dramatically overweight compared to uh, the Europeans or the Japanese. Huge difference. Does that make a difference in what it costs? Yes. People who are obese spend 36% more for health care, uh, from health care providers, and 77% more uh, for medicines than people who are not obese. So one of the big factors in our longevity um, is, is obesity. And that's not related to uh, what kind of insurance we have. One of the other factors is death on the highways. Uh, we have a dramatically higher rate than other countries around the world, and part of that is because we have a lot more miles that we drive in a much more spread out environment that we live in. The homicide rate in the United States is 10 times what it is in the United Kingdom. Uh, that makes a difference. When you net those out and you net out the difference between ethnic groups because we're a different mixture of ethnic groups in the United States than those countries that we compare ourselves to. You find that Americans have, uh, and you rough out the, uh, the difference in the way you calculate the infant mortality rate because we calculate it differently than the Europeans. When you rough out those factors, you find that our infant mortality rate is roughly the same as the Europeans and the Japanese, or even a little better, and you find out our longevity uh, is comparable or a little better as well. How do you measure results then if you're going to poo-poo infant mortality and uh, uh, longevity, or at least say that there are other factors involved? Well, one of the ways that uh, some healthcare professionals have looked at it is to, to look at survival rates. Survival rates from cancer, survival rates from other major diseases. There, America shines. There, our survival rates are significantly better than any of those other countries in the world. And that's, I think, a testimony to the quality of care they get. And I think, personally, it's a question of the fact that we have better access uh, to the specialists that deal in those particular areas and provide the quality of care. The other things I think you look at are the availability uh, of the specialist care when you need it. And there, there's a dramatic difference between the U.S. and Europe and U.S. and Japan as well. It's a simple matter of being able to see the specialists that you need to within a matter of days or weeks versus a matter of months. For many of the specialties, there's a wait of up to six months uh, in the United Kingdom and other ones uh, equally as long. You, in effect, um, get your results by simply not having the kind of care that you'd hope for. Well, what I want to share thoughts with you on, obviously this is a huge subject, on three quick things. One, some of the things that have been talked about is saving money for the system. Some of the challenges that we have with regard to health care, because I think they may be a bit different than what uh, you've heard about. And some of the ways I think you can save money. Obviously, these are all controversial, and I hope very much the students will, will want to challenge us on all of them or other areas that they bring up, and, and that's probably the best part of what we'll, we'll cover today. What are the challenges? Well, first of all, let me suggest there's some things that really aren't on the front edge of discussions uh, at this point, partly because they're simply so difficult. One of the challenges is the reimbursement differential. That's a problem you haven't really heard about much of, but the reimbursement di differential is huge. I'm not just talking about the differential from the parts of the country, and indeed the, the reimbursement rate for Medicare and Medicaid is significantly different as you go around the country. And that's because as they set up the government reimbursement programs, they would take historic cost in the area rather than come up with a common reimbursement rate. So for example, we don't pay someone the same for an office visit uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico that we do in Los Angeles, California. Uh, we don't pay someone the same for an operation in different parts of the country. One of the huge reasons for the difficulty in having health care in rural areas is because of that historic price differential that provided dramatically lower compensation for healthcare procedures in rural areas. It's not that doctors don't want to live in small towns. Some do and some don't. 
But the fact is any health care provider that goes to a small town in America faces the fact of having significantly lower compensation for what they do, even though what they do is exactly the same as it is in a big city. We talk a lot about trying to solve the problem of rural health care. It's easily solved, and that's to go to the source of the problem, which is that we don't simply don't pay health care providers the same as we pay them in other areas. San Jose, California, an office visits compensated at the rate of $87. In Omaha, it's $65. Um, actually, if you're going to live in Omaha, you ought to get paid more, I think. But, well, that's different. <laughs> Coloradans have a problem with Nebraska. You, you have to understand. Um, a dental crown in San Jose is $1,056. In Omaha, it's $778. Um, a coronary bypass is $74,000. Uh, in Omaha, it's $60,000. Dramatic difference uh, in that area. And it's one of the things we have to think about and address. Address particularly in rural health care because what we've done with the system we've imposed is we've literally dried up a lot of our small towns that don't need to be dried up. As you know, when the doctor leaves the town, when you don't have availability of health care, it impacts the entire community as you go forward. The second big problem also relates to reimbursement, and that is the government laid out reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid, as well as the plans that follow on uh, with that. Let me, let me be specific. One of the things that happens is Medicare and Medicaid over the years have told providers that they will pay them less than what their average billing is. So you might be compensated at the level of 50% or 60% of your normal fee uh, if you're being treated as a Medicare patient. You might be at the level of 70%, and these vary widely from community to community. If you're in the, uh, I'm sorry, the lower one is the Medicaid, in the neighborhood of 70 to 80% if you're Medicare. On the other hand, if you're a private health care provider, you might be asked to pay, uh, or private insurance company, you might be asked to pay 110 or 120 percent of the normal cost of a procedure to offset the discount that is made for Medicare and Medicaid. The way the system survives is you have citizens who pay their own bills or provide insurance subsidize the government insurance programs. If you change that balance, if you increase the number of government programs, or if you increase those treated under the government programs, what you do is increase those that are demanding a subsidy and reduce those that are paying the premium to health care provider. What are the problems with it? Well, one of the problems is Medicaid has gotten so low in its reimbursement that it is sometimes difficult to provide a physician that will take it. And I suppose off the hand you could say, well, that's not, not right of the physicians. They should, they should do that anyway. But many of them will tell you their simple cost of keeping their office open and processing the paperwork and maintaining the building and the staff is more than what Medicaid provides. We have a system that is collapsing in on itself because while we've set up the government programs to assist people in need or who are elderly uh, to, to get uh, health care, we've set compensation rates at a level where it's unattractive to serve them. And in terms of Medicaid, very unattractive to serve them. We are at a point now where we have a program in place, but it becomes very difficult to get people to serve those people. And one of the big challenges elderly have, or those who are low income, is not getting the health insurance. They have the Medicaid or the Med uh, Medicare health insurance. One of the big problems they have is getting someone to treat them as you go forward with it. As you expand the subsidies, as you reduce compensation in the government programs, which is indeed part of all the plans that are going forward, you aggravate that problem. That has to be addressed because it's quickly coming to a point where it will be more and more difficult for people already under government programs to get that assistance. Um, another challenge that I think is, uh, is perhaps the biggest one of all that we don't talk about is the unfunded portion of Medicare. Uh, what does unfunded mean? It means that we have a legal obligation under an entitlement program, and an entitlement program spends out automatically. 
We have a legal obligation under that program to provide health care for those in Medicare who've paid into the system. We have a Medicare trust funds. And yet there isn't the money in that funds or the potential of revenue in those funds to cover the obligation we're committed to. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean somebody with a green eye shade has invented a problem? Well, indeed, folks with green eye shades have made projections. Every year, uh, the Social Security Trust Fund and the Medicare uh, Trust Fund trustees end up issuing a report. They estimate what that unfunded liability is. Combination of Medicare and uh, Social Security unfunded liability currently is in the neighborhood of $58 billion. Now, trillion, thank you, $58 trillion. That's for the first 75 years as they talk about the funds. They also, you'll see another figure quoted that's much higher, that's the total unfunded liability. Uh, the $58 trillion is the smaller fund. What does that mean? It means a shortfall per person of $19,300 for every human being, man, woman, and child in the United States. For a family of four, it is an unfunded liability of $77,200. There is no way these programs can continue as they are. It's not a matter of Hank Brown says that, or Domenici says that. It's a matter of simple mathematics. Incidentally, I've looked at the numbers. I think you'll find the estimates are low, not high, that they dramatically understate the problem. We have a program in its current form that will collapse and is simply uh, unsustainable. And fourth, a problem that we've talked about and I think are genuinely concerned about is those that are uninsured. So there's some of the big challenges. Uh, the uninsured part, as you know, falls in, in a variety of categories of the 47 million that are estimated, and there's lots of estimates out there, some smaller, some bigger, but a portion of those are folks who uh, have the money to pay for their health care but choose not to buy the policy. Now, why would you do that? Is that kind of foolish? Yes. But one of the reasons you might do it is you're young, you don't get sick, um, as much, and if you buy a policy, you have to insure yourself for lots of things that help older people uh, or people who have illnesses that you don't think you're going to get. Um, indeed, the principle of insurance is to take money from those who are young and subsidize those of us who are old, a noble pursuit, I think, um, <laughs> not necessarily tailor the insurance solely for what might be in those categories. So there's a reason the people who can afford health insurance sometimes don't buy it. Um, there's also those who simply can't afford it. Now we've moved to take care of those in a number of programs. One, the Medicare program we've talked about. As you get older, there's some d disabled in that program as well. Uh, under Medicaid for young people and particularly uh, uh, single parent families. Uh, the S-CHIP program that just passed that carries, covers students up to 25 years of age, um, and uh, a few other areas that are also covered. So we have coverage in that area. But the coverage I think that people I think have the most empathy for are people who are generally not in those other categories, but generally don't have the money at the time to cover their health problems or health, their health insurance. Understand that not having insurance doesn't mean you don't have health care. What it does mean is that you have to rely on either health care providers treating you and you not paying them, or you have to rely on going to the emergency room. As you know, we have an emergency medical care statute that requires emergency rooms in all hospitals to provide health care treatment. Um, and thus, one of the things you'll hear when you talk about the Massachusetts plan is the theory is that you'll save money in the emergency room by having everyone required to be insured. We'll talk about that in a minute. But those are some of the challenges, obviously not all. Well, we've talked about saving money in a variety of ways. Let, let me list them because they're, they're a wonderful list of what we'd love to do, or I think most of us would love to do. We've talked about in some of the plans that are before Congress, uh, one, uh, no exclusions uh, for pre-existing conditions. Two, no upper limits in terms of the cost of health care. I have a, uh, a one-year-old uh, granddaughter who was born with a heart problem, a heart defect. 
Um, she is alive thanks to a rather exotic surgery, and she'll have to go back in another year for more surgery. But we think there is a chance that we'll be able to, uh, to, uh, to develop a life, maybe not a normal life, but a regular life for, uh, and that she'll be able to survive. Sweetest thing in the world. The surgery cost a half a million dollars. I say the surgery, the treatment. Uh, some of the, obviously, uh, having policies that have no upper limit uh, is an attractive thing because without it, it, it would make a difference in whether someone can have that or not. So no other upper limits. Electronic record, record keeping, no deductibles, no co-pays, free annual physicals and mammograms, preventative uh, uh, focus in terms of health care, uh, so you do more than just others. Um, uh, a Massachusetts plan that requires uh, emergency health care, uh, that requires everyone to have health care, and um, presumably would reduce the amount of health care administered in the emergency room. Lower profits for those insurance companies that seem to be so hated. Higher taxes uh, on the plans that they call Cadillac plans. They're probably the better insurance plans. So I suppose it depends on your, uh, your viewpoint. If, you, if you're not a fan of General Motors car, cars, probably you call it something else. But uh. Now, all of those things are ones we can understand and appreciate. There's a problem with those solutions, though. None of them save money. All of them. All of them cost money. Now you're going to say, wait a minute, Hank, that, how can that be? Uh, free physicals, aren't physicals good for you? Absolutely they are. And uh, that could add to the quality of health care. So it doesn't mean you, they are good things or you shouldn't do them, but it doesn't mean that they save money. As a matter of fact, all of these things end up costing money. The Massachusetts plan, the theory that they put that together on was, look, it's very expensive to get treated in the emergency room. Let's require everybody to have insurance and reduce that burden on the emergency room. What's the problem with that thinking? Well, first of all, it didn't work out. Massachusetts costs are much higher, not lower, with the plan. And the problem is that you have those people in the emergency room, whether they're busy or not. Uh, they're busy sometimes and not busy other times. You don't necessarily dramatically reduce the cost of emergency rooms uh, by excluding that care or taking the care of another way. In addition, they haven't been able to figure out how to get the cost savings, if there are some, pass back through uh, the medical system. Um, the taxes on the plans uh, that we've talked about, this is a direct pass-through. If you tax a group of health care plans, that money gets added to what people pay for health care. Now, the Congressional Budget Office scores that as a savings, and the reason they score it as a savings is because that will mean, one of the things that, that it could mean is that you'll have higher deductibles, higher co-pays, uh, lower limits on total, com total uh, uh, amount of health care used uh, with it which will mean more contribution by the individual who has those plans, but less through the plan. But it doesn't mean less money overall for health care. Well, those are controversial. Obviously, a, a electronic record keeping is a good thing. It's a valuable tool. It's a helpful thing in, di in analyzing what's the best treatment and how it works. But no one should go into this thinking that we're going to save money. So I've taken the punch bowl away. Uh, obviously, these are controversial and you want to debate them, but the reality is if you were counting on reducing the cost of health care or coming up with the money to do other things uh, through those kind of savings items, you're smoking something that isn't legal yet in New Mexico. Um, it may be in California and they may have a different approach out there. I don't know. How do you save money? None of these are fun. Unlike the other lists that we all loved, none of these are fun. Let me, let me go through them. One, uh, one of the proposals with regard to the new plans before Congress is to eliminate Part C of Medicare. Part C is one that gives people on Medicare some additional options. The cost is a little higher than the other parts of Medicare. Many of the people who utilize it like it. It gives them flexibility. But indeed, there would be a savings if you eliminated Part C of Medicare. And indeed, many of the plans Congress is looking at does that. Two. You could, uh, you could cut compensation for providers. 
you know, unknown, I think, to many people is we've been doing that for a number of years. Both Medicare and Medicaid providers year after year get a slightly smaller rate of reimbursement, uh, an adjustment to below um, inflation in terms of their cost adjustment, uh, requiring them to take more patients for less cost. Uh, the current plans before Congress do that in spades. There's a uh, $500 Billion. It's easy to get these mixed up. $500 billion saving program into most of the bills. What that means primarily is not necessarily waste, fraud, and abuse, although that'd be a wonderful thing if you could do it. What it probably means is lower compensation for providers. That will help save money. It will also make it more difficult to get to see a physician. Back to our problem with Medicare. It'll be much less desirable to serve someone who has their insurance on Medicare and Medicaid. Um, three, taxing uh, those with broad coverage or the Cadillac plans, we talked about that. They're currently they're talking about a 35% tax on some of those better ones. That uh, will obviously, uh, I think, has two problems with it. One, it won't add, it won't cut, uh, it, it will at least cut down some of those plans. So you'll have some savings there, but it's not magic. It does get passed on in terms of higher taxes. Four limit punitive damages, tort reform. Uh, it's very clear the states that have limited uh, very high punitive damages have had a modest impact in terms of uh, reducing defensive medicine, that is charging, uh, doing more tests than what is probably reasonable, or at least limiting the cost in that area. But no one should think that's the solution to healthcare problems. Uh, while it may save a small amount of money, well, in the billions, I don't mean to belittle it, it's certainly not going to, for example, offset the other things that are there. Rationing, this will save money. You can ration in a couple ways. You can ration in the way they do the Oregon health care plan, and I think of, of that as, as a, a rational way of rationing. Doesn't mean you'll like it, but what they did in Oregon is take a look at the procedures that are done and try and set priorities. They said, look, we've got this much money in Medicaid, Let's spend the money we've got in Medicaid, which is fixed, limited from the state budget, and let's use it for the operations that are most important. They went through, they put their own valuations on which ones were most important, which ones weren't. Obviously controversial, um, and spent it on the ones they thought were most important. What it means is no coverage for ones that don't make it on the list. That perhaps is rational, but it's very painful in one that uh, legislators across the country and in Congress have historically res uh, resisted. As a matter of fact, they've gone the other way. Most states mandate a broad range of coverages, not, not allow you to limit it. There's a different way of rationing health care, and that's the way the Europeans do it. And that's basically they have fewer doctors, fewer health care providers, longer waits to see a physician, and much longer waits to see a specialist. Uh, that kind of rationing, uh, it's a more subtle form of rationing, uh, does save money, and it's probably what we would move to. There's higher deductibles, ones that we said we didn't like, but indeed higher deductibles do help you save money. Higher co-pays help save money. Limits on coverage that we talked about save money. Um, there's another solution. It's one that I think we will go to in time, not right now. And that is, I think you'll see us go back and take a look at Medicare and understand that there is no way conceivably that we can make uh, our resources match what Medicare is costing. And there's no way to keep that system in place, that is, get physicians willing to, uh, to provide their services uh, in a voluntary way to, to people in that category. And at that point, I think what you'll see is the federal government go back and say, look, Medicare, we're going to set priorities on. The people who should get Medicare are the ones who uh, simply can't afford health care uh, on their own. And those who've paid in all their life to Medicare, if they have more than 75000 a year in income or some figure, 100000 50000 uh, simply are not eligible. And you will change Medicare from an entitlement program that uh, is universal or somewhat universal to one that is more like a welfare program. And it won't be done because we want to do that. It'll be done because we simply don't have any other choice. Well, I'm not going to continue to cheer you up anymore on, on this subject. 
my intent was to provide uh, some controversial thoughts and stimulate some questions. They tell me the students are willing and, and perhaps others of you would be willing to comment or ask questions on these outrageous ideas. We're going to start first with our student panel. So on the student panel, who has a question for Senator Brown? Please. Hi, my name is Ana Villalobos, and um, I'm a government graduate student here at NMSU. And my question is regarding, in terms of a maybe more pro pro um, kind of proactive approach, we look at childhood ob obesity and the, the way that rates just continue to rapidly increase. What do you think that perhaps state and local governments can do to implement policies to kind of prevent such such things like like these to occur, maybe to take a more proactive approach as opposed to just looking at the role of federal government? What can we do on a more local level to make sure that we don't get to the situation where you have children that are obese and then are facing things such as heart disease, um, problems that they really shouldn't have to be concerned about at such a young age, but they're now facing it because of things such as obesity. What do you think can be done at a local level? Level. That's a great question because it looks for a positive answer in that. Uh, next question. No, let me let me have a go at it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I I think to some extent what my mother did it was pretty simple. Uh, we had very limited resources, and uh, I simply never had cokes. Period. You're not going to get soft drinks. And part of the reason she came to that solution is because as she had gone through school, uh, she had had courses in nutrition that helped her understand uh, uh, the dynamics of that. Now, a lot of the courses in terms of colleges and even some in our high schools have been dropped, but clearly those nutritional courses that help people understand the impact of various foods and soft drinks and so on are important, and it's one we may, may want to reconsider. There's a second thing that I think of, um, and, and I don't know all of your personal experiences with smoking or not, but both of my parents smoked. My dad died at 65 with emphysema. My mother smoked five packs a day from age 16 on to, to 92. Uh, literally, she was down to three packs a day at 92. Um, so people have different tolerances for smoking um, with it. None of our children smoke. And hopefully uh, the example that Nan and I set was helpful in getting them not to smoke, but I think part of it was schools. Schools focused on it. Uh, schools really walked them through what smoking does to your lungs, what it does to your heart, what it does to your health care. And uh, I think part of this is simply getting informed. We can do it through the schools. We can do it through other means. Uh, I know some people have talked about it using the tax system. Uh, I'm less excited about that because I think the change has to come in someone's heart and mind to change behavior, not just taxes, but clearly all of those have a part. But it's clearly an enormous problem for us and one we have to address, and it goes far beyond uh, life expectancy, obviously, it, in, in health care costs. Obviously, it influences, influences both of those, but it goes to the quality of your living as well. So it's clearly an area we have to focus on in terms of uh, what we communicate to our offspring and what we uh, think of as includable in our and appropriate for our curriculums in school. Our efforts to reduce smoking worked, and it's because we got the information to the kids that made a difference, made them able to make a decision in their lives. Thank you, Senator. My, my name is Miguel Lozano, and I was just wondering, with your uh, time on the Budget Committee, um, you have a lot, of, a lot of experience with that. Uh, with the bills that are in place, the Finance Committee bill and H.R. 3200, do you think it's possible for them to uh, put a budget-neutral bill uh, into uh, action within this year? Is it possible to put a budget-neutral bill? They can pass it this year. Most of them are delayed um, for two and three and four years out. Uh, and, and some have alleged that that's because the people who voted for them didn't want to have them in place when they were up for re-election. Uh, uh, I, I certainly no legislator would act like that. Uh, from a legitimate purpose, uh, 
uh, you do need some delay between when you pass the bill and when it takes place to get the regulations in place, to get the organizations in place, and so on. So it's a legitimate reason to delay it somewhat. Um, could they pass it this year? Yes. I think they will pass something. There's, uh, and uh, it, it'll be a little more in that direction. The exact contents of it, I think, are very much up in the air. Please don't think what the Senate passes out is the final bill. Uh, because what happens, obviously, is things get then rewritten in conference committee, and uh, so we have a long way to, to go on this. In terms of the bills, though, a lot of what they've talked about in terms of saving money, uh, I, I think, is magic. I mean, is wishful thinking. Uh, let me give you an example. The 35% tax on existing health care plans that are good plans, my term, okay, Cadillac plans in, in their terms. Uh, that is a, what that means is a real penalty on people who now have good health care plans. Um, it also means that people will modify their behavior. And the CBO in scoring that is counting on that to some extent. That is, you won't have those plans. You'll have people avoid the tax by changing their plans. Now, the CBO tends to score things on a static model. That is, they tend not to speculate about changes in human behavior. And, you know, you often hear the debates on uh, uh, changes in the uh, capital gains tax. Uh, people who want a lower tax say it'll mean more capital gains transactions. People who want a higher tax said no one will change. So there's a, a, a real debate there, but it comes in on this thing as well. If you're, base, if you're funding the program out of that tax and then people change their plans, so they no longer come under that tax threshold, the revenue you are counting on to pay for the expanded coverage simply won't be there. So I, my sense is they may score it as revenue neutral. Uh, it is possible to get to that. Uh, but I think it'll be like all the other plans that we've passed in the, uh, that have been enacted in the past. They cost lots more than what they've forecast. That's, it's partly because it's difficult. It's partly because people want to get something passed. And somebody else is going to pay for it, but um, uh, I don't know if you agree with me or not. But the problem is, at the delivery level, it just costs costs too much. Would you ad address that? Uh, maybe? Well, you're absolutely right. A lot of those costs are, are breathtakingly high, um, and there are a couple things that are happening. One of the things that happens is you have a high cost here to pay not only for the cost of operating it, but pay for all those people who don't pay to operate it. Uh, and one of the reasons you see the insurance companies paying to advertise in favor of the plan uh, and subsidizing the effort to pass a new plan uh, is because they have a lot of people who aren't insured that don't pay their bills. Uh, they have a lot of people under Medicare and Medicaid that only pay a small part of the cost of the procedure. So when someone who's either paying the bill themselves or has insurance to pay the bill, they're not paying the cost. They're paying the cost plus all the unpaid cost everybody else has. They're paying for Medicare people who pay half or less. They're paying for, uh, excuse me, Medicaid people who pay half or less. They're paying for the Medicare people who pay three quarters or, or less. They're paying for the people who come in and don't have any insurance at all and don't pay or those who have money and just choose to not pay. And I, I think that's one of the things that makes our current model so unsustainable is you have so much cost transfer in, in an emergency room like that 
you end up paying far more than what the function cost as a way of subsidizing everybody else. Senator, some years ago, uh, I heard an excellent paper uh, on how to cut costs in healthcare, and the basic recommendation was we need to use far more mid-level providers and not be always dependent upon um, MDs, for example, and specialists. That a good share of the care that's rendered, dental, psychiatric, medical, could be done so by mid-levels who are a whole lot less expensive. But there is some resistance in the part of the medical community to go that route. Have you run into that as a recommendation, and does it have any potential for saving costs in, in health care? Governor, I think you're exactly right. It does uh, provide some savings, and it does uh, uh, have some potential, and it is used in some other countries more extensively. And uh, uh, so it is, I, I think it has real potential, and I'll see, you ha see that happens more and more. One of the things that's difficult for that logical kind of step to take place is the way we compensate people for health care. Um, and there tends to be, in the current system, no savings or very little savings on the person who, the patient, um, whether they see a, a professional assistant uh, versus the physician, um, that savings ends up being recognized to to the insurance company or others. Um, and, and so you don't have that direct link that you would in other commodities or other services that are, uh, that are more market driven. As you know, almost half of health care is now paid for by the federal government or through the federal government or through state governments combined. So it is a, it is a very, we talk about a free market. We don't really have a normal free market in, in, in this area. And I think that's what, part of what makes it unresponsive. But, you know, there's lots of things that can lead to, to, uh, uh, to, to more economical health care. Uh, we didn't used to have private rooms for everybody. Uh, we did seem, uh, see assistance sometimes rather than physicians. There's lots of things as necessity pushes us that way we can move. The problem is uh, it's like our list of wants. It, it never shows up on that list. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator, hi. I'm Terry Cole. I'm the CEO uh, with the Greater Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to our state. Um, we have been very involved in this health care debate, uh, just like many other business organizations across the country. What's uh, bothering us a great deal with the debate in Congress today is that the universal coverage perspective is being moved forward without regard to reforming the delivery system. Um, we are and have been uh, endorsing and supporting universal health care. We think it's important. But to do so without reforming the delivery system, which encourages waste, we believe, and also encourages and incentivizes using health care rather than the outcome of health care. And I wondered if you would comment on what is it going to take for us to be to have this debate side by side, universal health care together with reforming the delivery system. You know, I I think you, your your perspective is exactly right because it's the kind of adjustment we need to to make and to look at uh, for, in terms of alternatives to make sense out of this. And it goes back to the governor's comment and uh, uh, to uh, the secretary's comment uh, as well. Think for a minute about how you buy auto insurance or how you buy home insurance. The concept of insurance is not to cover every single thing that happens. The concept of insurance is to cover those things that are expensive enough that you would have difficulty caring for them on your own. Um, and it comes down to a big factor in the way we handle health care. We often, because of the tax law, encourage people to have health care insurance that either covers down to a small amount, in other words, very small deductibles uh, or copay, or 
require, even if you've, you have a higher deductible, require the paperwork processed on every claim. Imagine who would want claim on their house where you cover from dollar one? If you have a, a screen that gets damaged, would you file an insurance form? It might cost you $50 to process that form to repair a screen for five bucks. That doesn't make any sense. What we've done with healthcare because of the tax law is require the paperwork filing and processing for every single thing that comes along. It's idiotic. Now, what's the answer? One of the answers, I think, is to go with a higher deductible and provide insurance above that threshold level. Uh, so if you have a claim above $500, or if you have total cost above 1000 or that range will vary depending on what your state and life is, then file the claims. But don't go through the expense, the incredible expense of filing all that paperwork for very, very small claims. We've done, what we've done is abandon the principle of insurance in the way we've written health care insurance. And we've done it because of the, the, the way we've uh, uh, goofed up the tax laws, frankly. So I think part of getting the market to work and part of getting people to make rational decisions, gee, I could see a health care professional rather than the doctor for this scratch or whatever, uh, is to have higher deductibles, have good insurance for the things that we can't afford, uh, and, and induce some common sense market reforms in and health care providers for the levels below that. That makes a different consumer. That makes somebody shop around sometimes. It makes sometimes people much more willing to accept professionals. It, it, it makes a different decision about whether you get a private room or a double room. Or, uh, it makes a whole different range of decisions on that area. It raises a consciousness and awareness of cost uh, and of potentials for savings that simply doesn't exist because of the way we've structured the current system. So I think the greatest hope is one, expand uh, the medical savings account, which some of the bills uh, eliminate or debilitate, and encourage uh, wide ranges of our insurance to go to a higher deductible. That's one of the reasons why you see uh, significant uh, insurance co or uh, 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 processing cost, administrative cost, not just in the private programs, uh, but in the public programs as well, even though they don't do much in the public programs of uh, focusing on fraud and that sort of thing, you still have very high administrative cost when you throw all the cost in. So part of the advantage here, I think, or the potential is to, to bring medical insurance back to what it should be, that is insurance. Um, that dramatically reduces uh, administrative cost. One of the solutions we didn't talk about that, that is talked about in Congress is a single payer. And that is part of what the European systems have. Because the government pays for everything, they don't have billing. Um, you, you have less paperwork involved in, in terms of collection because you're, you're only collecting from the government as you process it through. They don't have quite the savings that you would hope for in that, but that is one of the theorized savings, that is to have only one person paying. Um, and there indeed are some savings in that, but it means a total loss then of the connection with the healthcare process. Um, but I do think moving, up, accommodating the higher deductibles uh, makes lots of economic sense as well as healthcare sense. Hello, Senator. My name is Paul Wiggett. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here in New Mexico State. Um, one of my biggest concerns that I've had over the last couple of weeks is that in all the town halls and even in this lovely congregation of people we have with us today, um, a lot of the people we're trying to help can't make these meetings because they work two jobs and they're single parents and they can't have a voice for themselves and they're the people that are adding a lot of burden to the healthcare system because the only opportunities they have to go see a doctor is in the emergency care or after hours care. How are we going to uh, assist the cost load on those patients um, when their simple lifestyle and their, the, 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 the life that they're living is not allowing them to access a regular doctor? They can't even choose their doctor. They have to go to whoever can see them. 
at any given time. And I feel a lot of the conversation has left those people behind and left the conversation to those of us who can't afford health care, who can take the time out of our day to talk about it, and who can go look for any doctor we can find and have that competition amongst the market. Great question, and, and you got right to the heart of what I think is a concern for most Americans, and a genuine concern by the vast majority of people who look at this problem. In terms of those that are single parent, uh, single parent families, they probably are, and, and in difficult economic circumstances, they probably are uh, covered by Medicaid. Uh, so a substantial portion of low-income people, particularly in the single parent families, are covered already by Medicaid. Um, uh, uh, the dramatic portion of the uh, large portion of the elderly uh, are covered by Medicare. Uh, the disabled, uh, a big portion of them, not all, but almost all of them are covered by Medicare as you go through. So a lot of the categories that you have the most empathy for and concern for are covered. A lot of those that weren't covered were picked up by the S-CHIP program uh, that covers students up through uh, the age of 25. Uh, with a very generous kind of a, a coverage as you come into that. But you do have a portion of, the, uh, of Americans who do fall on hard times, who don't have the resources to pay for a physician and, as you point out, have to go to the uh, emergency treatment or get treated by a doctor and simply not pay uh, that physician, uh, which happens a, a lot, as, as you can imagine, as well. Uh, that number varies, and the estimate is not that it's 47 million, but it may be in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 million. Some say less, some say more, but it's somewhere in that range. That's the area I think we ought to be focusing our activities on and providing real assistance for them. But we've got to do it honestly. I mean, to, to think we're going to pass a program like has been talked about that has a dozen things that increase cost and pretend it's not going to add to the cost, that's, that's fantasy. Is it going to cost more to cover those 10 million or those 8 million people? Yes. I think it's something that both Democrats and Republicans and liberals and conservatives understand the need for, would appreciate and be willing to work on and do. And I think it's, I, from a personal point of view, I think that's a legitimate part of what we're talking about. Um, but that's much different than the broader categories that uh, you were talking about in what comes under health care reform that, that deny other people uh, freedoms and option. Assisting those in need is something I think all of us agree on and we ought to focus on. One more question in the back. Good morning, Senator. My name is Myron Armijo. I'm from the uh, Pueblo of Santa Ana. I'm a lieutenant governor. Uh, my question to you, uh, before I go any further, I'd like to say good morning to Governor Carruthers, uh, Congressman Lujan, and Secretary Napolitano. But uh, Congressman, uh, my question to you is with this um, health care debate um, raging in Washington, uh, how will this affect um, the Indian Health Service and its delivery of uh, medical services to the, uh, the Pueblos or to Indian country? A uh, wonderful question. I don't know if all of you could hear was related to how was this impact the Indian health care services. That's separate legislation, as you know. One of the things that the federal government is committed to is uh, some very significant expenditures and treatments for uh, uh, Native Americans on their reservations. Uh, at this point, most of the bills do not encompass that. They leave that in place. Uh, but clearly, that is part of our picture. Um, and, and impacted by our ability to fund it. But at this point, it stays in place in almost all of the bills. Listen, let me close with just a thank you. It's such a treat for me to get to come and to see old friends and, and uh, to address the topic. I commend you for this wonderful conference. Uh, it is typical of what I would have expected uh, a Pete Domenici uh, to put on to encourage people to think about the toughest problems of our age. And uh, I'm really honored to be part of it. Thank you. Well, as promised, what a hot topic, and thank you everybody for the wonderful questions. I think it added to the dialogue for today's conference, but Senator, thank you. Uh, you had to get on a plane, uh, you had to come down to our beautiful state, get lectured on the spelling of Chile, and uh, we wanted to just give you a token of our appreciation for your uh, commitment to Senator Domenici and to this wonderful conference. This is a tile created especially for the conference attendees 
by Virginia Marie Romero, and it's our token of appreciation for you and for the time you're taking away from family. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wasn't that a dynamite treatment of the health care? Uh, he had all the solutions, we just can't get them adopted. Uh, I, I think the debate goes on. It's a topic that's going to be with us for a long period of time. We're going to take a 15-minute break right now. We want you all to come back. Uh, Senator Landrieu is en route right now and be here. So take 15 minutes off and we'll... The preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.